Hi guys, in this video I'm talking about what I think about 23andMe and specifically what I think about their health report. Do I think you should get testing through 23andMe for health purposes? The short answer is no. Coming from a genetic counselor who specializes in genetic testing for hereditary cancer, this is the short answer. If you want to get tested through 23andMe for genetic genealogy purposes to find possible relatives, or if you're interested in fun traits such as whether you flush after drinking alcohol or how much caffeine you're likely to consume, yeah, that's fine, that's completely harmless. But if you want to do this test to find out whether you have a higher risk of cancer, I really don't recommend it and I'm going to explain in this video why. At the end of the video, I am going to give one possible exception where you might want to consider this test, but even then, it's probably there's probably better options. So stick around till the end of the video and I hope you learn something interesting. So obviously everyone can make their own decisions, but my goal in this video is just to point out some information that you should be aware of before getting any health-related testing through 23andMe. So they actually offer testing for a couple of different genes related to health conditions, but I'm just going to focus on three genes uh, that are related to cancer risk because that's what I specialize in. So in terms of cancer risk, 23andMe looks at three specific genes. BRCA1 and BRCA2, which you may know as the BRCA genes and are associated with hereditary breast and ovarian cancer, and another gene called MUTYH, which is associated with a predisposition to polyps in the colon and colon cancer. They don't look at any other cancer-related genes. And now the key thing about this testing is that they're not looking at the entire sequence of the code in these genes. They're only looking at very particular mutations. So in BRCA1, they're looking at two particular mutations, and in BRCA2 they're looking at only one specific mutation, and in MUTYH they're looking at two mutations. But there's thousands of possible mutations in these genes that if somebody has them they could increase the risk of cancer. So that's the problem with this test, is that people think they're having comprehensive testing of these genes, but really there's only a very tiny portion of the genes that are being looked at. The three mutations or variants that they're looking at in BRCA1 and 2 are mutations that are more common among Ashkenazi Jews. So that's Jews that are of Eastern European descent. And within MUTYH, the two mutations that they're looking at are mutations that are more common among people of Northern European descent. But if you're not from one of these populations, or even if you are from one of these two populations, you could have a mutation anywhere else along the gene, aside from those specific spots that they're looking at. So that's the problem with this test. And now I'll be fair, I took a really good look at their website and they have a lot of information about everything that I'm discussing today. They really try to be as transparent as possible and talk about how they are only looking at these mutations and that this testing may not be appropriate for you. On their website, they also recommend that you speak with a genetic counselor before and after getting this testing done, which I think is really good that they suggest that because a genetic counselor is specialized in interpreting genetic test reports and letting you know what other testing you may need or how these test results are applicable to you based on your personal and your family history. So I think it's really good that they put that on the website. My concern is that maybe a lot of people are not reading all the fine detail on the website and the website is a little bit cumbersome so it can be hard to navigate all that information. So I think a lot of people are getting these tests done without knowing the limitations of the test. Because of the way they do the testing, looking at only these mutations, it's possible that somebody has what we call a false negative result, meaning they get the testing done and no variants are reported. So a person who was maybe concerned about their risk of developing cancer, possibly because they have a family history of cancer, gets this test, sees that there are no variants reported in BRCA1 and 2 and in this other gene, MUTYH, and then they feel reassured. Oh, they didn't find any cancer variants in me. But again, they're only looking at a few very particular mutations that are likely not even applicable to you based on your ethnic background. And you should really have testing of other areas of the gene and you should actually have the whole gene looked at. And not only that, there are many other genes that are related to hereditary breast cancer. There's more than 10 that we know of. And same for colon cancers, there are a lot more genes that are related to an increased risk of colon polyps and colon cancer. And of course, in addition to breast and colon cancer, there's many different types of genes that are related to other types of cancer risks. 
So the testing is extremely limited in the number of genes and then in the specific mutations that they look at. So that would be a, called a false negative result. And again, the company does go into a lot of detail about this on their website. My concern is that somebody will get these test results and feel falsely reassured despite all the information that's available on their website. In fact, I looked around on YouTube and saw a lot of people that have posted their reactions to their 23andMe results, including Ancestry, but also their health reports. And I see a lot of reactions where people are really excited to get a negative BRCA result. And I just worry there's a lot of people walking around out there with complete misinformation about what their test results mean especially if you yourself have had cancer or you have a family history of cancer, this testing is probably not appropriate for you. And by the way, even if you're fully Ashkenazi Jewish or you think you're fully of Northern European descent, there have been many studies that show that people from these populations can have mutations elsewhere in BRCA1 and 2 and of course in other genes as well. The risk of false positive is lower if you have this testing done and you're found to have one of these mutations in BRCA1, BRCA2, or MUTYH, it's likely that you actually do carry one of these mutations, but the FDA still recommends that you get this testing confirmed through a medical grade lab. So we would never make any recommendations about your medical management based on genetic test results from 23andMe. We would still want to confirm it with a clinical grade lab. Also, although the lab only tests for very specific mutations, consumers can actually download their raw DNA and then upload it to a third-party website that interprets the DNA and spits out all kinds of information. And that information is really where there could be a lot of false positive results because those are not clinical grade genetic testing companies. So it has happened a couple of times to me in clinic where patients come in with test results that they sent out to these third party companies and they come in all worried about these test results. And then we do testing in a clinical grade lab and those tests are completely incorrect. So there's a possibility for false negative and false positive with the 23andMe health reports. Now I have heard of some success stories. There is a woman who is well known in the field of Jewish genetic genealogy. So that is using genetic information to help with mapping out your family tree. And she has publicized her story about how she did testing through 23andMe, just really for ancestry purposes to see if she could find some genetic cousins, but she ended up being found to be a carrier of one of the common Ashkenazi Jewish mutations in, I don't know if it was BRCA1 or 2. And I think she confirmed this information through a clinical grade lab, which confirmed that she did carry the mutation. And then many other family members were tested and were also found to have the mutation. So this really provided information that this woman could use and her family members could use to guide their medical management and you know, be aware of their cancer risk and take certain steps to reduce their risk. So that was a really lucky find. But despite the few success stories like that, I still don't recommend this testing across the board. Again, only in very particular situations, which I'll touch on towards the end of the video. So the woman that I just talked about is Ashkenazi Jewish, but interestingly, 23andMe actually just published a study a couple of weeks ago reporting on all the BRCA1 and 2 mutations that had been found in people who didn't self-report any Jewish ancestry. They found that among all the mutation carriers that they had found, just over 20% reported no Jewish ancestry. So this is supported by other literature where sometimes these Ashkenazi Jewish founder mutations are found in people who are not Jewish. But then when they looked at the DNA, they were able to see that more than 60% did actually have some identifiable Jewish DNA, but a large proportion didn't. So these mutations have been reported in people of other ancestries. So it's interesting that uh, 23andMe has found similar findings. Also among the mutation carriers, a lot of them didn't report any family history. And this is also consistent with what we see in the literature. In population-based studies, meaning where people are tested for BRCA1 and 2, not based on family history, about 50% are found not to meet the medical criteria for genetic testing, meaning their family history isn't what we would consider strong enough to warrant BRCA1 and 2 testing. So that's really interesting. This study is basically confirming that these Ashkenazi Jewish mutations are found in people who don't have any Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry, as well as in people who don't really have a family history that is suggestive of these mutations. So if you're interested in initiating your own genetic testing, there are now some medical grade labs that offer patient initiated testing. 
So this type of testing is good for many different types of people. If you don't have insurance, which would cover a genetics consultation, patient-initiated testing can be an option through one of these labs. Or if you really don't have a family history of cancer, or you're adopted and you still want to know about your possible cancer risk, those are really good options. And there's two labs that I will mention. I'm not sponsored at all, and there will probably be other labs that will start offering this soon, but the two that I'm familiar with are Color and Invite. And both of these are labs that geneticists and genetic counselors use all the time and can now also be used by consumers directly. The difference between these labs and 23andMe is that at these clinical grade labs, the testing is overseen by a medical professional. And usually as part of the testing fee, genetic counseling will be available. And I know that there are genetic counselors that work at 23andMe, but they don't offer genetic counseling to their clients. Although I think they could refer you to someone if you ask for it. But typically through these clinical grade labs, there's always genetic counselors that you can speak with who can really go over your results, make sure you've had the appropriate testing based on your family history and based on your own history. So if you do want to start your own testing process, there are options that are better than 23andMe. And the way it works is pretty simple. Both of these labs have forms that you need to fill out about your own personal and family history of cancer, as far as you know it. And then you provide some demographic information and then you usually pay online. Um, both labs I think are offering it now for about $250, although that price might drop in the future. And then they ship you a saliva collection kit to your home, which is the same thing as 23andMe. It's just a little tube that you need to fill up with saliva. It comes with very clear instructions that have pictures on exactly how to provide the saliva sample. And then you ship it back through FedEx and you can actually schedule FedEx to pick it up at your house. So the testing process is really convenient. And once you've shipped it back to the lab, it typically takes about two to three weeks to get the results. And then, like I said, you can usually get genetic counseling from these companies so that you can understand what your test results mean. I'm sure at some point in the future, it will be common to just test everyone for big cancer panels to include all the breast cancer genes that we know of, all the gynecologic cancer genes, all the colon cancer genes, etc because we want to have this, this information before you develop cancer, or we want to prevent cancer. So I think eventually that's where we're going. And you know who knows what that will look like. There's still going to be a lot to figure out. Who does the testing? Who interprets all the data that we're going to be getting? What do we do if we find unexpected results? But one thing that is sure is that this testing will likely be done through clinical grade companies, not direct to consumer companies like 23andMe. Now I did say I was going to explain one possible exception where I think it could be okay to test through 23andMe. And that is if you have absolutely no known family history of cancer and your four grandparents are of Ashkenazi Jewish descent, and you're really not too concerned at this point about having the most comprehensive test available, but knowing that these three mutations in BRCA1 and 2 are quite frequent in the Ashkenazi Jewish population, one in 40 people carries a mutation in one of these genes. So if you really just want to get that testing done because of how frequent it is in the population, that could be a reason to get that testing done. But still, if you were found to have one of these mutations, it would still be recommended that you have testing through a medical grade lab before going ahead with any medical management related to these genes. So in summary, there's a couple of ways now that you can initiate your own genetic testing, but getting testing through a lab which is not overseen by a medical professional and is not targeted based on what's in your personal and family history may not give you the information that you're looking for. So I really recommend that you look into a clinical grade lab like the ones that I mentioned if you're interested in initiating your own cancer genetic testing. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. Please let me know in the comments if you have had genetic testing through 23andMe and you got their health report. What did you think about those test results? Were you confused? Do you have any questions? Or have you actually gone ahead and then confirmed some test results with a clinical grade lab? What was your experience like? If you like this type of content, please consider subscribing to my channel. I post videos about topics related to hereditary cancer. And check me out on Instagram here where I post a lot of other stuff that don't go into my YouTube channel. Thank you again so much for watching. See you next time. Bye.